Thank you, Demaria. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody this morning? It's uh, good to be back in Nashville. I uh, had the privilege, uh, along with my son Ty, to go visit uh, the church in Medellin, Colombia, last week. And um, I was, yeah, it was very, very encouraging. Um, I have some, some pictures to share with you. It was uh, uh, re- really cool. We got there, and one of the first people I met was this guy, Jer- Jeremin. Um, and uh, he's the guy with the towel about to get baptized. And so, you know, he, he was one of the guys who was there to greet us as everybody got there. And uh, we're talking, and hey, how long have you been a part of the church? He said, I'm getting baptized on Sunday. Uh, so we all got to go. And um, can you, if we can stay on that one, um, can you imagine, like, a more spectacular backdrop to a baptism? And they had the, guy, the brother with the guitar there singing songs, and there was like 40 of us on this like rooftop. It was just so incredible. Um, and it actually, Jeremin is actually from Venezuela, um, and he's a 22-year-old young man who moved. Basically, there's so many Venezuelans uh, in Colombia that have, you know, gone, gotten out of the country. And so he moved. Basically, you know, he didn't know it, but he moved to find God. And he was just so excited. He was with us, all the different activities that we were doing. It was just, uh, it was super, super encouraging. And um, so then on uh, one of the days, we got to go out and kind of just see some of the, some of the city and some of the area. And so this is, the, the next uh, slide is just the, the Tennessee crew, uh, the Nashville crew that was there. So obviously, myself and my son and Jordan Amaris. Um, who uh, will will be back tonight, actually. And then uh, Jocelyn and Kirsten Eve, who are staying another week with the crew from San Antonio. So there was about 15 or so college students from San Antonio that um, basically, it was actually kind of their idea. They called and said, hey, we'd like to go do like a mission trip in South America. Can you help us organize it? Where should we go? And I said, well, hey, let's go to Medellin. Um, and, And so the next slide is, the, you know, it's us, the San Antonio crew, some of the people from Medellin that were hosting us. Um, why, why Medellin? Well, they have really focused on youth. And it's a church that over the past 15 years has grown from just a dozen or so to something like 140 members. And a lot of those people are young people. And they just focused on uh, you know, the university as best they can, but just youth. And it was so cool hearing all these amazing stories. There was this one story of a a young lady who was really looking for God, and she and a group of people were a part of a church, and they they figured out, hey, you know what? We don't know that our our church is really teaching what we see in the Bible, and so they continued looking, and and they got connected with the church here, and it was like 10 people that all, uh, you know, kind of one after another became Christians as a part of the Medellin church just as they were really searching for the truth. Uh, it was, you know, this young lady and her now husband, his, like, former girlfriend and um, his mom and, and her sister. I mean, it was just all these different people in different ages. And it, it was just, it was so encouraging to hear about how God is working in a place that probably many of us have never, you know, been to or even thought about. Or, like, it's, four, it's a city of four million people. You know, it's not a little town. And, um, but, but God is just working in an amazing way. So I was so encouraged um, just to be able to, uh, to be there with brothers and sisters. Um, you could probably hear a little bit in my, my voice. Um, I, uh, uh, it's not, I took a test. It's not COVID. Um, it's like, I think it's allergies. So exactly a year ago, I lost my voice. And I thought, okay, you know, if it's like allergy related, I'll get out of the country and, and I'll, I'll avoid it. So I'm there on Saturday night, and I'm supposed to preach the next day, and I start to feel a little something in my throat. I think, oh, no. Um, and so I, I probably sounded similar last week, and um, so we're, you know, we're trying to kind of to get over it. But it was just, it was so faith-building and encouraging, and uh, they just send their gratitude and their thanks to you as, you know, we, we, we do these missions offerings, right? And they're one of the, the churches that we support and I just, again, want to tell you how, how faith-building it is to see, wow, God is, is working and doing amazing things. So, again, I just want to thank you as a church for your support and for, for letting us go. Um, well, one other thing real quick here. Um, Adriana mentioned there's some people who um, are, are moving in. 
And so I haven't actually gotten to meet you guys in person, but I know uh, Jeremy and I have spoken on phone, texted. So this is the Hicks family, Jeremy and Stephanie um, and their children, um, <laughs> Nate and Jada. Is that right? Um, and we're so grateful to have you guys here. They've moved in from, uh, from California. And uh, so welcome to Tennessee. And I just definitely wanted everybody to know, hey, you know, let's, let's go welcome the Hicks family. Great way living in Murfreesboro. And uh, so we're really excited about that. And then also uh, Jerome and Shay uh, uh, Ball, right, Ball? Um, and so they've moved in from Queens. Uh, and they're living in the Gulch. So if you want to go, you know, hang out at the Gulch and then go see them, uh, you know, they said bring it on. So, um, so I want to welcome you guys as well. Um, so great to have. We got, we got people from the East Coast. We got people from the West Coast. Uh, is, is there anybody I'm missing? I mean, like Adrian said, there's new faces. Anybody else moving here? Okay. Okay. Uh, Gia, we're just embarrassing you, huh? <laughs> Hi, Gia. Um, welcome. What, what's Gia? Gia, what's your last name? Okay, I'm going to have to go catch up with you and, uh, and get that and, and write that down. You're from Austin. Hook them. Uh, my, my wife and I, I went to school in Austin, and, you know, we're there. Hey, even more, hook them. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, we're both we're both Longhorns. So, uh, okay, I know it's the other UT. I know, I know. Um, Gia, sorry, you'll have to get used to it. You know, here, you know, our UT is the other UT. So, um, okay, why, why don't we take a minute and we can go grab Gia. We can grab the Hicks family, the Ball family. Um, and uh, just have a minute here to fellowship before we jump into our Bible study. I, I'd really encourage you. You know, to stand up, meet somebody, give somebody a hug, encourage somebody. One of the most amazing things about being disciples of Jesus is it's not just about, you know, coming to church and sitting down, but we get to connect. If you need a topic, what is your favorite comeback story? So if, if you need a topic to kind of, you know, kick around with somebody, what's your favorite comeback story? We'll take like three or four minutes, um, and then I will try very hard to, to get you to come back and sit down, and we'll have a little bit of Bible study together.
Okay, we're gonna start the uh, difficult process of calling everybody back in. If I could uh, sing a song, I don't think my voice is gonna let me sing a song. So if we can go ahead and start the process of making our way back to our seats. If we can go ahead and be making our way back to our seats, we're going to have some time to study God's Word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together. Thank you that after um, a decent amount of time of not being able to come together, we get to come together, we get to hug each other, we get to encourage each other. Um, God, thank you that we get to take communion, we get to sing. Father, thank you that we have your word to study. And I pray that as we study your word here, that you guide us, that you speak to us. As always, you know exactly what we need, what every single person in this auditorium needs. And God, we just ask that your spirit speak to us, your spirit work through your word, um, that we walk out of here having received the message that you want us to hear. Uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to interact with you in this way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I put a... Uh, cough lozenge in my, uh, in my mouth here to kind of help me with this. And um, I heard a, a story, you know, about a preacher. I don't know if you guys have heard this, right, about a preacher who would always kind of have a cough lozenge in his mouth, and, and he'd know that when the cough lozenge was gone, that meant it was time to end the sermon. <laughs> and, and there was a Sunday that just kept going on and on and on, and people were looking at their watch and thinking, what is going on? And, and he figured out that it wasn't a cough lozenge that he put in his mouth, it was a button. <laughs> now, I don't know what kind of cough lozenges he was having that taste the same as a button. Um, but, you know, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, maybe it's just a preacher's uh, joke, right? We're going to talk today about rebuilding. We, we started a series two weeks ago on Ezra and Nehemiah. We're not going to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, although I love to do that. Uh, what we're going to do, we, we have some plans, things we want to study out in the fall. So we're just going to do, you know, more of a topical series. And so a few weeks ago, we set up the context and the background. And, uh, and then last week, Dad um, uh, walked us through really the, the context with the prophets and what was going on around this time with the prophets. And so today we're just going to jump in, and what we're going to do over the next three weeks is just look at three kind of main big picture points, right, that we can draw from Ezra and Nehemiah and just the idea of coming out of exile. And so that some of the things we've talked about, right, is just this idea of coming out of exile. God wants us to come out of exile, and he wants people to find a home. And it's, it's a topic from Genesis to Revelation. At the end of the day, God is calling us home. Um, but even before we go home to be with him, right, he wants us to be at home here and to learn how to be at home here, you know, in that tension of what we have right now but not yet. And so just this idea that we, we want to be home and, and we, want, we want this to be home, right? We want our church family to, to be home, to really feel like home. And, and, and what's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah is they are out of their home, they're exiled, they're dislocated, and they're going back home. And, but, but they don't just go back home and they show up and everything's ready, right? Um, they have what you would call like a fixer-upper, right? Um, it's, okay, we're going to go back home, but we gotta, we're, we're going to have to do some work. And, and again, you know, again, we talked about just the, the prophets and how the prophets were so instrumental, Haggai and Zechariah. Um, and, and really moving them along and, and helping them to, uh, to get the work done they needed to get done. So what I want to do today is just talk about, okay, what, what's, what's the rebuilding that went on? And we're going to look at basically three phases of rebuilding. We're going to read a lot of Bible today. So I'm hoping it can be a lot of Bible and maybe a few thoughts and that the Spirit will really speak to us. All the scriptures are going to be up here. Feel free to turn in your Bible if you'd like to, but I'm going to try to keep it moving um, because I do have a cough loss, and it's not a button um, in my mouth here. So it sort of starts off, right? Phase, chap phase one is 
going back and rebuilding the altar and the temple. And the key figures are Zerubbabel and Joshua. And the time period is something like 539 when Cyrus made his decree that people could go back and start to rebuild. Um, and and there, there was kind of some different things that happened we'll look at. And then the temple is finished in 516 B.C. Um, some of you like dates and historical stuff. Some of you don't. So, you know, kind of take that for what it's worth. There will not be a test. Um, in Ezra chapter 3, so Ezra chapter 1 um, Cyrus uh, gives this decree. Ezra chapter 2 is like a list of all these people that went back. And then Ezra chapter 3, it says, When the seventh month came, and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, <laughs> they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. And, and they go on and list all these other, um, you know, religious observations and festivals and sacrifices. But the, at the end of the day, they go back, they build the altar, and they, they spend time using the altar and worshiping God the way that they know how from an Old Testament perspective. In, in Ezra chapter 3, verse 8, it says, in the second month of the second year, after the arrival of the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites and all who returned from captivity to Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. So the first thing is the altar, and then they're like, okay, we got the altar in place, we can worship, now let's start to build the temple. So they start by laying the foundation of the temple. And when they lay the foundation, in um, the, the next section here, the end of verse 11, and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of his temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. And so, you know, you have the beginning here. They build the altar. They worship God. They start to build the temple. You know, people are emotional because maybe they're like, man, this is a lot smaller foundation than the temple we used to have. Or maybe they're just so happy that it's finally happening after 70, you know, plus years. But at the end of the day, the, the rebuilding has begun. And you got to start somewhere, right? They felt like, hey, God has called us back. And he's called us out of exile, and we got to roll up our sleeves, and, and we want to rebuild because this is how we believe we're called to worship God. And so that's what's on their hearts. That's what's on their minds. Um, so the construction has begun. But in Ezra chapter 4, in verse 1, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esaradon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. And the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. <laughs> they bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And we skip down to verse 24. Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So great start. They're all excited. They get the altar in place. They put the foundation down, and then they face opposition. And just to, to kind of, you know, I guess give you an overview, you might think, well, these guys said they wanted to come worship. So why, why did Joshua and Zerubbabel reject that? And basically, all, m most of chapter 4 is to kind of give examples of why they rejected it, because it wasn't a sincere offer to worship with them. They're, they're really, their intent was to subvert um, and to, you know, corrupt, and they, they didn't want the Jews reestablishing 
Jerusalem, basically. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't really an in good faith offer. Because to us, it might seem like, gosh, you guys are kind of jerks. Like they just said they wanted to worship. Um, now, what we're going to look, um, as, as like in later weeks, at maybe some of the, um, maybe, I don't know if mistakes is too far, but, but some of the thinking that maybe wasn't healthy that we can learn from. But that's not today. Today, we just want to talk about the rebuilding. And at the end of the day, they're excited to rebuild, and they face opposition, and they stop. And the work stops until, like it says, the second year of Darius, which was like 520 BC. So if they got to, um, if they got to Jerusalem and started building in 538 or 537 or 536, we don't know exactly what those dates are, but something like that. The, the work stopped for like 15 to 18 years. So 15 to 18 years where because of opposition, because of their fear of the people around them, they didn't do any more work. Um, and I think just for us, how, how has opposition stopped us from doing the work God wants us to do? It's a good, it's, it's a good now hopefully, you know, none of us say, yeah, it's been 18 years since I've done what God wants me to do. But I do think it's a good question for us to ask. Like, how has COVID stopped me from doing what God wants me to do on his house? And, and hey, you know, like we, we talked about this, but New Testament, this is the house. Not this building, these relationships, this community, and helping other people, you know, come into this community and, and come to know God. So how, how has COVID kept me from building God's house? How, how have other things, you know, maybe how have hurts from the past? You know, how, how have things, you know, from before that I've experienced and gone through, how have they kept me from working on and building God's house? It's a rhetorical question. It's a different answer for all of us, but I think it's good for us to think about because opposition, that can be the effect, right? So if we pick it up in um, Ezra chapter 6, I'm sorry, um, Ezra chapter 5, Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1, now Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Ido, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josedach, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, <coughs> supporting them. At that time, Tatanai, governor of the trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozani and their associates went to them and asked, who authorized you to rebuild this temple and to finish it? They also asked, what are the names of those who are constructing this building? But the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews, and they were not stopped until a report could go to Darius and his written reply be received. So this is in the second year of Darius. So again, 520-ish B.C., 18 or so years after they first got there. And, you know, again, as, as Dad talked about last week, this is where when you read in the books of Haggai and Zechariah, it's Haggai and Zechariah, maybe these young prophets, full of fire, right, full of zeal, that they come and they say, come on, guys, what are we doing? We got to rebuild. You know, we're, we're living in our paneled houses where we're comfortable. You know, we've built our own lives, and we've stopped working on God's house, and the old guys, Zerubbabel and Joshua, uh, we don't know how old they were, but, you know, they've been there at least 18 years, right? They listen. And they say, you're right. Let's get back to work. And they don't ask for permission. And they don't wait for permission. That's one of the things that stands out to me is they, they, this opposition had kept them from working. Nothing changed except for Haggai and Zechariah saying, let's go. Let's do something. Let's make a difference. And so we need, we need the young people that say, hey, I'm not going to wait on permission or older people to tell me what to do. I want to go make a difference. And then older people, I'm going to include myself in the older people. And they told me I'm not invited to that luau. Um, so we've got to listen. We've got to say, that's right, absolutely. And we've got we've to follow their lead and work alongside them. But at the end of the day, that's... The work, the work needs to be done, right? I mean, we need to be building God's house. Um, that's what God has called us to do. 
Now, one of the things that was interesting to me here, verse 4, they also asked, what are the names of those who are constructing this building? <coughs> hey, we want to go ask Darius, um, what's going on here? So what are you guys doing? And what, what are the names? We, we want to take down the names. We're taking down names. So if somebody came and said, hey, we're taking down names on who's building God's house in Nashville, I would want my name to be included. I would want, you know, whoever, I would, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am, I'm one of the rebuilders. From God's perspective, right, I would want my name on that list. Would you? Do you want your name on that list? I would, I would want my name on that list. Just kind of food for thought. Somebody's taking down names. And, and again, this isn't, sometimes we start to think, oh, well, if I'm not, you know, if my name's not there, if, I, if I'm not rebuilding, then maybe I'm not saved. No, no, we're not, this is, we're not talking about salvation here. None of this is salvation issues. We're just talking about we're so grateful to be God's children that we want to put God first, that we want to be a part of rebuilding his house because we're, we're excited to and we're inspired to. Does that make sense? Sometimes in our context, everything goes back to, well, maybe I'm not a disciple. No, that's, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about we have this opportunity to do something. Let's do something. In Ezra 6, um, so Dar these guys write to Darius. They say, hey, what are these guys doing? Can, they, say there's, they say Cyrus made some decree. Um, can you look that up? And Darius looks it up, and he finds the decree, and he gives the go-ahead to build. And in verse 14, <coughs> Ezra 6, 14, so the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, a descendant of Ido. They finished the building. They finished building the temple according to the command of God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. So this is the end of phase one. They, they push through, they get the go ahead, they rebuild the temple, the, the, the Persian government ends up helping to sponsor this, and from their own you know, funds, they help to rebuild the temple, and we have this amazing victory. And these guys, they, in a sense, they have their spiritual home. They've come out of exile, and they have their home. Um, but again, so the ho home is something they had to build. They had to build the house of God. God, and like I said earlier, God wants us, he wants that to be this for us, right? He wants this to be that for us. He wants this community to be our home. But sometimes we just, we just want to show up, right? But we, we, no, we all are a part of the process of building that. And I think we've got to learn from Zerubbabel and Joshua, from Haggai and Zechariah, okay, um, if I want to have this amazing church family, then I got to be a part of building this amazing church family. And so what can I do? How does that, you know, what does that look like? How can I help build what God wants us to have here in Nashville? Um, and I, and I, again, I just think this, it, this community is supposed to be that, something that we are excited to be a part of and, and something that, that we're drawn to. And man, I, I could get behind that, right? I could get behind, okay, I want to help build a community that, that we're drawn to, that we, that we feel at home and loved and built up and inspired and taken care of. It's really, it's really inspiring and encouraging what the Spirit has done this past month in, here in Nashville. Um, we've seen Devor Solomon uh, become a disciple of Jesus. Now, Devor... I need, I need you or Vic or somebody to give me some better pictures of your baptism. This is, this is uh, just a little kind of clip from a video, or actually from the live stream. So if anybody's got any, any good pictures, uh, Devorah, of your baptism, uh, I, I need that. Because, um, I mean, I, I, you, you guys can, if we can go back, I, you're just going to have to take my word for it that that's Devorah, right? Because <laughs> um, we know that's Vic there with the mic. So, um, yeah, so, so the next one was uh, Spencer Copeland. Um, who was also baptized in the past month. And he was baptized, and then he's in the military up in Clarksville, and he was shipped off. The group in Clarksville is meeting up in Clarksville today. So say a prayer for them. God's doing great things. 
up in Clarksville. Um, the next one was Nate and Vanessa Davis, who were part of our group out in Fairview. Um, and so they were baptized in the past month. And I think I said it at one point, but Vanessa is Cynthia Dillingham's sister. Um, and she'd been studying the Bible for a long time. And, and Cynthia is a longtime member of the church here, along with her husband, Rick. Um, Abby Clark was baptized just a week and a half ago. Uh, and so Abby's over there. She's not at all excited, as you can tell. Sonny and Meg Sharp were restored to the church family. Um, and they're usually sitting right there. I guess they, they couldn't be here with us today. But, um, but man, I mean, many of you have known Sonny and Meg for a long time. And just what a victory. What an incredible inspiration. And then last week, we got to see Debbie Jones uh, restored. Um, is Debbie here? Debbie, okay. There's Debbie right there. So, D Debbie, welcome. Um, we're so grateful to have you. But I, I think what we're, we're seeing, right, that people are coming and they're finding a home. Isn't that encouraging? I think we've, we've had to do some work here, right, for, for, for this to be home. We got to keep doing that work, but it's encouraging to see God working and, and to see God's going to do even more. So phase two, phase one, you know, we just kind of talked about phase one. Phase two of this rebuilding process in Ezra and Nehemiah is actually with Ezra. If you'll notice in one through six, Ezra doesn't even appear. <coughs> so in Ezra chapter seven, verse eight. Um, now, this is actually 58 years later. Um, so this isn't, you know, chapter six ends, they've finished the altar and the temple, and Ezra doesn't show up till 58 years later. So that's all, that, that's all, what, what was going on 58 years ago? I don't know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, stop and think about that, but you could think about that for a minute. That's a long time. But Ezra shows up 58 years later, and in Ezra 7, verse 8, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem on the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month. He arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study <coughs> and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and its laws. So Artaxerxes um, gives him a commission. Artaxerxes is the king at the time, and he gives them this commission. And in that commission, he says in verse 13, Now I decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites who volunteer to go to Jerusalem with you, may go. Uh, you are sent by the king and his seven advisors to inquire about Jerusalem, Judah and Jerusalem, with regard to the law of your God, which is in your hand. And then down in verse 25, and you, Ezra, in accordance with the wisdom of your God, which you possess, appoint magistrates and judges to administer justice to all the people of Trans-Euphrates, all who know the laws of your God, and you are to teach any who do not know them. Whoever does not obey the law of your God and the law of the king must surely be punished by death, banishment, confiscation of property, or imprisonment. Now, what is it that Ezra basically is commissioned to do? He's commissioned to go and teach. He's going to go. He, he's a scribe. He's, he's knowledgeable about the law of Moses, um, the book of the law of Moses. And so his commission is to go teach and then set up ways, right, where, where the people are going to know what they're supposed to know. And then Artaxerxes says, or else. Um, so there's, there's a seriousness to this. This is a serious part of the building of, of community, the building of God's people back in Israel. This is a, a serious part of rebuilding. So in chapter 8, basically his group um, arrives, delivers all these treasures to the temple, they make offerings, and then <coughs> what many people actually think comes next is Nehemiah chapter 8. I know that's confusing, but a lot of people think that what we read in Nehemiah chapter 8 is actually what happens after um, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem. And so we're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. 
they found written in the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses that Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. So there was this festival they were supposed to be observing, and they read in the law, oh, wow, there's this festival we're supposed to be observing. So they right there, go ahead and observe the festival of booths or tabernacles. And then in verse 18, it says, day after day from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. So this is basically, you know, the summary of Ezra's ministry. He was commissioned to teach. And this is, you know, it's right, it's a big chunk of, of what's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah. Yes, there's the building of the altar and the temple. Yes, there's the building of the walls, which we'll read about in a minute. But right in the middle is people had to be taught. They had to be taught how to, to live the way God wanted them to live. And so as we talk about rebuilding, I think it's good for us to think, what does it mean for us to rebuild? You know, we're not laying stone on stone. So what, practically speaking, what does it mean for, for us to rebuild? And we've talked about how COVID gives us an opportunity to reevaluate. And we've talked about how, as, as we talk about our, our theme for the year, greater things, that the way greater things happen is the Spirit leads us into the new ways that the Spirit wants us to work. And the idea that, that what God wants to do moving forward is not necessarily going to look like what God has done in the past. Now, we know it's got to be based on Scripture, right? And so it is good as we come back and we say, let's rebuild, for us to think, okay, but what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And am I getting from Scripture the direction about, okay, what does it mean for me to rebuild my faith? You know, maybe where it's been hurt or cracked. What, is it, what does it look like for me to rebuild my faith? What does it look like for me to rebuild my love for God? Because we all get to points, right, where we realize, you know what, I need, to, I need to work on my love for God. I need to rebuild my relationship with God. Amen. What does it look like for me to rebuild my convictions? Maybe my convictions in the past have been based on the church and, and less on Scripture. Okay, what does it look like for me to rebuild my convictions, not on my opinions, but actually on Scripture? Amen. What does it look like for me to rebuild my devotion to God? Because it's easy for us to, to go too far one way or the other. Devotion to God means I'm in sin if I'm not physically present at every meeting of the church. Okay, well, maybe that's, you know, a little too far one way. Um, some may disagree. <laughs> but, but on the flip side, right, we can go to the other side. It's, ah, it's not that big a deal, whatever. Ah, just, I'll just hop online. It's easier that way. You know what? Uh, it's a little far. You know, I can't make it today. What, what does it look like, my convictions about being devoted to the body? What should my, my convictions be based on Scripture? Not based on church culture, then or now, and not based on convenience or my own opinion. What, what does it look like for me to be devoted to this community? And what does it look like? What, what, are my, what do my convictions need to be based on scripture about this community? What about my mission? What should my convictions be about my mission based on scripture? In Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance <coughs> of the law of the Lord and to teaching his decrees and laws in Israel. I think we have a slide for this one. Uh, awesome, thank you. And you can see the devoted right there is underlined. But this, this scripture just grabbed me. Like if you just stop and meditate on this particular scripture, he devoted himself to study and observance and to teaching. And the, the word devoted here, it's translated in different ways. Um, but the Hebrew, um, it, it, it's something along the lines of he established his heart. So Ezra had established his heart. He had given his heart over to the study and observance and teaching. And think about that order. First, I need to study, and then I need to put that into practice and observe what I'm studying, and then I need to teach somebody else. Doesn't that make so much sense, right? And, and he, this is what he did. He was an example. He put it into practice. 
He moved, you know, halfway across the world, you know, at the time to go and, and to do this, to study, to observe, to teach. And so I think it's a great question for us, like, okay, am I studying? Am I observing? Putting into practice what I'm studying? And then am I teaching? We, we, we are a church that believes in a, a set of core Bible studies, right, it, that help us to, to understand the basics. And then we want to keep building on that. We want to keep going deeper and deeper. We want to put those into practice, and we want to teach other people. So are we doing it? Just good questions for us, right? Like part of the building means doing these things. And, um, and so those are just kind of some of the practicals. I think if, if you're like, okay, I'm not doing it, but I want to do it, find a partner in here and say, hey, I would like to study the Bible. I would like to learn. I would like, you know, I want to be like Ezra, but I'm just kind of starting from square one. Or maybe I'm restarting and I need some help restarting. And I think for those of us that maybe are already doing some of these things, I think we got to look around the room and think, okay, who can I help? We got to look around our neighborhood and think, who can I help? You know, we got to look around work in our classrooms and think, okay, how can I, how can I put this into practice? So that's phase two. Phase three. So this is about 13 years after Ezra. So Nehemiah comes in, and um, this is around 445, and Nehemiah builds the wall. So in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, he hears about the wall, and he prays, and he's kind of torn up with the fact that the walls are broken down. In Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, I went to Jerusalem. Um, so Artaxerxes actually sends him. But in verse 11, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up... To, uh, I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. And then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. So Nehemiah gets back and he examines what's going on. He's like, man, okay, great. We have, we have a temple. We've got some good teaching, but there's a lot of work to be done. <coughs> the, the city lies in ruins. He, is, he, he, he surveys the situation and he's willing to face the facts. And, you know, sometimes we've got to face the facts. We, we've kind of been in a process for a while now as a church both locally here in Nashville and globally as our family of churches of facing the facts. Hey, there are some things we need to learn. There are some things we need to change. You know, there, there are some things we need to, to get right and then, you know, then, then maybe acknowledging, okay, maybe we overcorrected in some ways. And, and we, but we have to face the facts. And we've been trying to do that. But, I mean, that's something we all individually have to do as well. We've got to face the facts of where our own faith is. I think we got it with COVID, we have to face the facts. With COVID, we have to face the facts that, you know what? Two years of pandemic, two plus years of pandemic have shaped our thinking, our habits, our routines, our mindsets. Some of that maybe is good. We've talked a lot about rest and how the Bible teaches us to rest. But on the flip side, some of it's not good. And we got to face the facts. You know what? I've kind of gotten out of some healthy routines. I've got to reevaluate. You know what? Th there's probably some things I need to make some decisions about, and I need to go ahead and come out of exile. And I need to realize there's some rebuilding needs to be done. We just need to face the facts, admit what we need to admit so that we can move forward. And so Nehemiah says, hey, guys, everything's a mess. And what do the people say? It says they replied, let us start rebuilding. I love that. It's, it's simple. Okay, we face the facts. Let's, let's start. Let's start rebuilding. They began this good work. We got to start somewhere. 
have you started? You know, um, maybe, maybe now's the time. There's no better time than now. Maybe you have started and, and you just need some encouragement and some help, but let's start rebuilding. Let, let's, let's rebuild. Um, now, as you can imagine in verse 19, what we have is as they begin to start rebuilding, what generally happens, right, when you really get started is the curveballs, right? And so in verse 19, when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or, or any claim or historic right to it. So they get going, and then there's opposition. Um, chapter 3 details how all these different people were working all these different parts of the wall. And it's actually really cool to kind of see, even last week, you know, Dad talked about um, that these people are named because God cares about people. And God cares about us. And he sees what we're doing for him. Um, but then in chapter 4, Nehemiah 4, verse 6, it says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Verse 7, But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we will kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near, uh, near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So they start rebuilding. They face opposition. They, they build it up to halfway, all the way around. But then the, the, the opposition intensifies. And this is a turning point, right? You can hear it in their voices. Oh, no. You know, we're not, we're not going to be able to do this. There's too much opposition. We're getting too tired. And, and they, get, they get tired. And they get discouraged. And they get overwhelmed. Can you relate? You know, you, you, you start the rebuilding process, and, and there just comes a point where you're like, this is a hard, and I just, I don't know. I don't know if I want to keep doing it. I don't know if I can keep doing it. I don't know if I'll be able to overcome the obstacles, and, and I'm just thinking about, um, you know, in, in the ways that Adrian and I have served through the years, and just different, I can think about points in Austin when we were working with the campus ministry. It was about a five-year period, and I can think of points um, part of that was during the, um, the letter that, you know, came out with our family of churches that caused a lot of change. And, and there were just points where it's like, this is hard. And I'm discouraged. And I don't know what to do. Um, and, and there was just that, that turning point, right, of, okay, well, am, am I going to keep doing the work? I can think about a point in, um, in the Rio Grande Valley where, you know, we were serving with the church there and we were trying to really kind of get that church going and, and it felt so slow and so hard and we were focused on campus and we, um, we started getting things going on campus and then there was, there was opposition. There was a girl I drawn to study the Bible with that um, decided she, she was the, the student body president. She was also a journalism major and she decided that she was going to write um, this article um, and use all this stuff from the 90s. This is in 2010. She used all this stuff from the 90s about our family of churches and connected it to Adriana and connected it to us. And this article is all over campus, you know, naming us and naming the church. And we're like, this is hard. What's, what's going to happen? I think about, you know, we've been here four years. And I can tell you um, that the Nashville church has been through a lot. And so being here, and I know you're all with me, I know you all feel it's like we want this to be a thriving, happy, encouraging church. And then there's deaths. And there's a pandemic. And, and then there's just the hurts that so many have experienced and trying to figure out how to move forward in a healthy way. We, we all come to turning points. 
What are we going to do when we come to those, those crossroads moments? And Nehemiah in verse 13, he says, Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, the rest of the people, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So what, what did he do? What did they do with this crossroads moment? Nehemiah said, okay, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to move forward. We're going to have a plan to keep working. And it says that when the enemies realized these guys aren't going to stop, they backed off. And then Nehemiah, I mean, and this is how all of us should think, right? Hey, at the end of the day, we're going to do our part, but God is going to fight for us. We're not going to stop building. We may not even know what we should do, but we're going to keep working, and we know that God is going to fight for us. So we make a plan, and we move forward. And I'm so excited about the plans that we have, and we're talking about, you know, organizing the church into regions and focusing more, you know, on just on different regions of Middle Tennessee, much like we, we have going on up in Clarksville, out in Fairview, and just the idea in the coming years, right, of doing that more and more and more and focusing on, on just different areas. Um, and we have a plan, actually, after the, the vision conference that we're going to in Orlando um, in the middle of August to kind of present to the church, hey, this is what we'd like this to look like. So please be praying about that. But, I mean, we have a plan, and we're going to keep moving, and we're going to keep moving forward, and our God will fight for us. But we make that decision, and things don't just automatically get easy. In chapter 5, there's all these internal issues, and then in chapter 6, Tobiah and Sanballat, they continue harassing and scheming and plotting, and they're trying to get Nehemiah away so they can kill him. And um, in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. So they, they overcame, it, it didn't, the adversity didn't stop, but they just kept building. And that's one of the things about this, right? Is that it's not just, okay, they got together, they built it, boom, it's over. No, but it's, you're talking about a period of like 100 years, 75 years between the first people coming back and then the altar and the foundation and the temple being built and then Ezra coming and teaching and then Jeremiah. And if you keep reading Jeremiah, he's even got to come back 12 years later and kind of fix things again. And it's, it's ongoing. It's continual. We keep building. We keep rebuilding. And at the end of the day, we, we have to ask ourselves, okay, am I going to be like Zerubbabel and Joshua and Ezra and Nehemiah who were builders? Or am I going to be like the unnamed enemies of Ezra back in, in the book of Ezra? Am I going to be like Tobiah and Sambat who were they, they were, they were interested in tearing down? Our society just tears down. Right. And it's so easy to critique and to tear down and say, this is what's wrong and this is what shouldn't be, and I'm just going to tear down. Yeah. Or are we going to be builders? I want to be a builder. Yeah. I want to build something. We're not going to always do it right. And when we make mistakes, we'll apologize and we'll change. But let's build. That's what we want to do is, is we want to build for God. 
Now, what does that look like practically? We've said it so, so many times in the church here. You need to have a great relationship with God. You need to rebuild your relationship with God. Is, is his kingdom really a priority in your life? You need to have great relationships in the community. Being a part of a small group, being in a one another relationship, coming to things in person. Because you just, you can't have great relationships if it's not important enough for you to come together in person. The other thing you can't do from home is serve. With the worship, with children's ministry, with the AV, with ushering, with just giving people hugs and smiling and loving them. You can't do that from home. Now, there are situations, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, that really needs to be home. What I'm talking about is our rebuilding our convictions about really loving and building this community. And then what about our relationships with those in need, serving the poor, sharing our faith, studying the Bible with people? This, these are the practicals of rebuilding. And I started off talking about comeback stories and asking you, what's your favorite comeback story? Because that's what all of this is, right? Rebuilding is, hey, we're a comeback story, right? Hey, things got hard. Things got discouraging. Things got messy. But we're going to come back. We're going to make a comeback. There's a, a, a woman named Ramona uh, Pearson. Um, in uh, 1984, she was in the Marine Corps. She was this math prodigy. She's 22 years old. And one night she's on a run. She gets hit by a drunk driver, breaks 104 bones, is in a coma for 18 months. When she wakes up, she can't speak. Um, she can't hear. Um, and, you know, most people would have just written her off. But she didn't write herself off. Um, after coming in a coma, she was blind and deaf. Um, she had lost nearly half her body weight, couldn't articulate her thoughts. Her basic motor functions were significantly impaired, meaning she had to relearn how to walk without assistance. Despite the severity of her injuries, Pearson's courage didn't waver. After undergoing speech therapy, she regained her ability to speak competently. Then she learned to read Braille, which allowed her to dive into academic textbooks. She completed undergraduate degrees in psychology in just two years. Um, 11 years after the accident, she regained her sight. Five years after this, she got her doctorate in neuroclinical psychology. She created a foundation uh, that she, um, and, and built her own company, which she later sold for $10 million. Um, she just, she, she was gonna build. She's a builder. Um, Karoli Takax, I have no idea if I said that the right way, and don't be disturbed by him pointing a gun at you. Um, he was a competitive pistol shooter, and he was the best in the world. He won national and international championships. Um, he was going to probably win the 1940 Tokyo Olympics. Um, but during a training session with the Army, a, a grenade exploded in his right hand. So he no longer had a right hand, and that was his shooting hand. Which, you know, most people say, well, I guess, you know, that, that was fun. That was fun while it lasted. So he said, no, I'm going to shoot left-handed. And he went on to basically achieve the same level of success. Um, and after World War II, he won the gold in 1948. Um, and then he won another gold four years later in 1952. Um, you get your hand blown off by a grenade. And you say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to build. Because he was a builder. Um, Louis Zamperini. Um, he, uh, th there's a book and a movie called Unbroken. Before World War II, he was uh, on his way. He was eighth in the 1936 Olympics in the mile. And he might have been the first guy to break four in the mile because he was pretty young when he, in, in 1936. But the war started, and so he um, served in the war in World War II, and his plane was shot down over the Pacific, and he spent 47 days at sea with no food. They had like this chocolate bar. They figured out how to like catch fish. Um, the other two guys that he was on this boat with died, if I remember correctly. 47 days in the ocean just floating on this like raft. And he finally hits land and becomes a Japanese POW for two years. But I mean, you, you read about this guy and just, he was a builder. Wherever he went, he was just gonna figure out how to build. He overcame. And um, I just think, man, these, these people, they just decided, I'm, I'm going to stand for something. I'm going to build something. 
this is what we want our community to be, right? Is a community of builders. Well, we're, we're pulling for each other. We're building each other up. We're helping each other be comeback stories. So let's, let's decide to be that if we're at this turning point. Let's decide to be a comeback story. Let's decide to be builders. It's time to rebuild. Let's stand. We're going to close with a song.